Hello and welcome to Distillations, the science, culture and history podcast. I'm Michal Maya, a historian of science and editor of Distillations magazine here at the Chemical Heritage Foundation. And I'm Bob Kenworthy, CHF's in-house chemist. Now here's a scenario for you. You or someone you know has kidney failure. The good news? In 2016, medicine has gotten really good at performing organ transplants. Scientists have been experimenting with transplanting organs for quite a long time now. But if you needed an organ, you were out of luck until about the mid-20th century. But today, the issue isn't technology. It's just that there simply aren't enough organs to go around for everyone who needs one. And people whose lives are at stake are willing to do almost anything to stay alive, which creates some serious ethical dilemmas. For example, compared to the United States, Israel has an especially big discrepancy between desperate patients and available organs. This has led some Israelis to exploit the black market. Reporter Dalia Mortada tells us how things are slowly changing. In the dialysis ward in Tel Aviv, Yosef Tabush sits in a big padded chair. His arm is jabbed with needles attached to long, tangled tubes. They turn brownish red as they pump the blood from his body into a dialysis machine that clears out the toxins. This machine is doing the kidneys job. After about an hour, Yosef starts to wiggle in his seat. My translator, Itamar, explains what's happening. He must be getting tired. Uh, he's starting to feel the, the tiredness. He's feeling the, the, the cramps. Until Yosef finds a match, either from Israel's National Transplant Center or from a person who donates a kidney, he has to keep going through this exhausting process. Back at his house in suburban Tel Aviv, Yosef makes sure he gets plenty of rest. Yosef's patience is running out. If I had the money and I didn't have other complications, I would have flown abroad and done the transplant instead of waiting eight years on dialysis. Yosef says it would cost him around $150,000 to buy a kidney on the black market. He and his wife, Esther, actually considered emptying out their savings to get a transplant abroad. But Yosef's too sick to travel. Israel has a low rate of organ donation from people who are already dead, about a quarter of that of the U.S., But there have been a lot more living donors in the past few years, people who give one of their kidneys to someone who needs it, for example. Some Israelis who need other organs or who still can't find matches look for other ways to get the life-saving transplants they need. Brokers in Israel connect patients to donors abroad, usually in countries like China, Sri Lanka, or Costa Rica. We almost went to Sri Lanka for the last transplant. And the truth is I was very scared because we would have had to carry a lot of money. Can we even say this on the radio? The whole world knows this stuff happens. Before 2008, this was not illegal in Israel. The country's organ donation laws didn't even exist, so there were no laws to regulate organ trafficking. Back then, insurance companies would even reimburse patients for their black market transplants. Now, all that stuff is banned, but Israel still suffers from a really low rate of organ donation. Today, less than a fifth of Israelis have organ donor cards, and out of the people who do have organ donor cards, almost half their families refuse to donate their organs after death. Most people say they won't donate their organs because they believe it violates Jewish law. It mostly comes down to the issue of brain death. Yes, I believe in brain death. The medical association determines that death is brain death. And many rabbis also believe in it. But a lot of rabbis don't. In medicine, brain death occurs when there's no more blood flow to the brain and it stops working. It will stop sending signals to the lungs to breathe. So oxygen stops flowing and the rest of the organs die too. But many Jews don't believe a person is dead until they stop breathing and their heart stops pumping. By then, it's too late to donate the organs. When a person is brain dead and their organs are going to be donated... They're kept breathing through a ventilator. But Yosef says it's not really religion stopping people. He thinks they need an incentive. Let's say I'm a person who wants to sell my organs for money. I wouldn't go to the black market broker the way one would now. I would go to the National Transplant Center. And the National Transplant Center pays 100,000 shekels or 80,000 shekels or whatever. In Yosef's plan, the National Transplant Center takes over and gives the organ to the next person in line who's a match. Since the government pays for Israelis' health care costs, Yosef says this will save the state money. 
This 100,000 shekels or 25,000 dollars, if you compare it to the cost of dialysis to the state, is very small. When you think about dialysis, it costs the state 500 dollars each time per person, over two years, three times a week. It more than covers the more than 100,000 shekels that the state will pay for someone to sell their kidney. But not everyone thinks it's a good idea to offer cash for organs. That's definitely a big no-no. Jacob or J, everybody knows me by J Levy. That's L A V W E. Dr. Levy is a leading heart transplant surgeon in Israel. He was heavily involved in drafting Israel's organ donation laws. Back in 2005, Levy was horrified when a patient told him he was scheduled for a heart transplant in China in two weeks. And I looked at him and asked him, "How come they can schedule you to undergo heart transplant ahead of time? You understand that somebody has to die in order to provide his heart for you." Levy suspects his patient's heart came from an executed prisoner in China. In the years since, China has banned the practice of selling dead prisoners' organs, and Levy lobbied to have organ trafficking explicitly banned in Israel. We all of a sudden, the number of tra- outgoing transplant tourists of Israelis going to all these uh, illegal venues has dropped tremendously from 150, 200 cases per year to no more than 20, 30 a year. Levy says he can't blame patients for doing whatever it takes to stay alive. He says it's the doctors who are willing to operate that are in the wrong. As long as there's a physician, in, the, in our case a surgeon, that has to be an intermediate because the kidney cannot jump by itself <laughs> from, the, from the vendor to the recipient, then the ethic rule applies to the physician. While Levy strongly disagrees with giving cash for organs, he does think more needs to be done to urge people to donate. And he's helped make changes. To provide priority in organ allocation to those who have committed themselves and registered to become organ donors. Since Levy's idea became law in 2012, people registered as organ donors for at least three years get priority on the transplant waiting list. In this commercial, a man holds up an organ donor card and says, waiting in line is a matter of death. Sign, get ahead in the transplant line. There are people who, ethicists, who disagree with this. This is a form of compensation. That's Avram Steinberg. He's a leading medical ethicist in Israel and an Orthodox rabbi. And he doesn't see anything wrong with compensating people for organs. I don't understand why doing something good has to be done altruistically. I'm a physician, and I hope I do good things with my profession, yet I'm getting a salary. I'm not doing it for free. He says, if you want an analogy, look at surrogacy or egg or sperm donation. These are acts that are not life-saving, yet people are compensated for it. No one is required to do it altruistically. Like most ethicists, Steinberg says using cash to convince people to donate organs could easily be used to exploit the poor. That's why he favors other incentives, like covering donors' medical expenses and reimbursing them for the time they have to take off work, stuff that's included in the 2008 law. Steinberg admits compensating donors isn't the only answer to Israel's organ deficit. So he's working with Israel's rabbinical authority and the National Transplant Center to introduce a new organ donor card. The idea is to convince people that it's okay to donate their organ, even under Jewish law. That's what Rabbi Yeshayahu Heber preaches. He founded an organization called Gift of Life, dedicated to getting people to donate a kidney, just because they can. Transplants from a living person are completely okay in Jewish law and a great mitzvah, a great good deed. Heber founded Gift of Life after his own experience with kidney failure. He spent about a year on dialysis before a friend turned out to be a match and donated his kidney to save Heber's life. Heber doesn't focus on the issue of death or brain death. He says it's hard to change people's minds about that. Instead, he hopes to at least solve Israel's kidney deficit by convincing people to donate while they're alive. Living donations are the only way to solve the problem. Today, Heber is advising Yosef on finding a matching donor. The rabbi tells Yosef that he'll need to look through more donors to find a match because he's so sick. Yosef slowly nods. He's clearly very tired. The closer I get to dialysis, the more toxins have built up in my body. And I can really feel it. The dialysis machine is not as good as a kidney. It's not like God intended 
It's not like how God created the body. Until Yosef finds a match, he has to keep going through this exhausting process. For Distillations, I'm Dahlia Mortada. Everyone agrees that there's a supply and demand issue with organ transplants, but people are torn about how to solve it. Who gets to make the decisions? Should it be doctors? Should it be patients? The 20th century brought a slew of advances in medical technologies, like cloning animals and making test tube babies. But we figured out how to do all these things before we'd fully thought through the ethical implications. Art Kaplan and Robert Baker are two bioethicists, both trained in philosophy, and both have been working in the field of bioethics almost since the field began. Before the 1960s, ethics and medicine were left up to the doctors themselves, and most concerns were about the welfare of the patients and about doctors behaving professionally. Medicine needed some help. They got too technical, too narrow, and they needed to keep the human side of medicine going, and they were getting ethical dilemmas. That's Art Kaplan, Director of Medical Ethics at New York University's School of Medicine. I think bioethics delivered. We helped develop concepts like brain death. We started to argue about the importance of informed consent. We tried to argue about ways in which it would be ethical to get organs when somebody died because transplant was emerging on the scene. But you know, another key role for bioethics isn't just answering questions, sometimes it's raising them. Why do we do it that way? Or is that the only way to do it? Or are you sure we should be doing this at all? Even though we didn't get professional bioethicists until a handful of decades ago, Bioethics itself has been around for a while, even if we weren't calling it that. Uh, Interestingly, the earliest medical ethics documents that we've got in North America are these midwives' oaths. That's Robert Baker. He's a professor of bioethics at Union Graduate College Icon School of Medicine. We called him up to find out when medical ethics started. And it turns out it's all about women. This is great. Modern medicine develops in the 18th century. When it develops, physicians, uh, midwives confront a series of problems. For most ordinary people, they were the most important medical practitioners in any town, village, or city because half of the population uh, more or less gives birth, and uh, the giving birth was a female Uh, activity. Men were more or less excluded from it. Since future generations depended on their work, midwives had power. And not so surprisingly, authorities decided that power needed to be controlled. To practice midwifery, you had to have a license. In 16th century England, you'd get it from your local bishop. In 18th century New York, you'd get it from a city official. In both cases, you'd swear an oath. And these oaths were absolutely fascinating. Eleanor Pede's Oath, Canterbury, England, 1567. I, Eleanor Pede, admitted to the office and occupation of midwife, will faithfully and diligently exercise the said office according to such cunning and knowledge as God hath given me, and that I will be ready to help and aid as well the poor as the rich woman being in labor, that I will not destroy the child born of any woman, or permit any woman to name any other to be the father of her child, only he who is the right and true father thereof. Also, I will not use any kind of sorcery or incantation in the time of the travail of any woman or any manner of witchcraft. Midwife's Oath, New York City, 1716 that she shall be diligent and ready to help any woman in labor, whether she be poor or rich, that in the time of necessity she will not forsake the poor woman and go to the rich, that she will not suffer any woman's child to be murdered or hurt, that she will not administer any medicine to produce a miscarriage, that she will not enforce a woman to give more services than is right, and will not conceal the birth of bastards. I had polio. I was one of the last people with polio 
in the United States. I think the last polio outbreak was the one I was part of in Boston. I was a little kid, six. That's Art Kaplan again. It got me thinking a lot about ethical issues in healthcare. That was a time when your parents couldn't stay over, couldn't see your dog, which bothered me a lot. They didn't tell us the truth about what happened to other kids because some of them died and they wouldn't tell us that. They would tell us they went home or something. We knew that was very unlikely to be true. And the only thing that they managed to do was make sure we got our homework on a daily basis, um, which seemed to me also unfair if you were sick, but that's a separate issue. So I think I got an early interest out of that tough experience. Art's come a long way since then, and he now deals with any and all bioethics issues, including the cost of healthcare and genetic engineering. He's also put a lot of thought into the way organ donations currently work in the U.S. and has some ideas for how it could be better. I first got interested in this problem way back in the early 80s. And at that time, there were even fewer organs being donated when people died. And I was interested in why that was. And this is where bioethics can also take or has an empirical side. I began to survey hospitals, and I quickly established that most hospitals were not asking families when someone died about organ donation. So I tried to put together a model law that said when someone dies, you have to ask. Not that they have to say yes, but they should be asked. And that law was first enacted in Oregon and New York and then picked up in about 40 other states and soon became a accreditation requirement. It's called Required Request. And that boosted up organ and tissue donation uh, quite a bit because asking turns out to be a key to getting. But still, there are a lot of people who say no, and there are a lot of folks who aren't sure, and they're not sure what their loved one wanted. So we now have a system that says opt-in. If you want to do this, you carry a card, you sign up when you go to motor vehicles, which, by the way, I have to say, may not be the ultimately wonderful place to make decisions about organ donation, other than the fact that at motor vehicles, you may wait there long enough to die there, in which case they can probably get your organs. But um, you still are opting in. You're making some positive uh, step to do it, and folks don't necessarily want to do that, or if they do it, they don't tell their other family members. In any event, I think we might move to an opt-out system. Still respects choice, but now the people who don't want to do it have to say they don't want to do it. Polls say the majority of Americans do want to be donors, so I'm not sure that shifting our default, as they say, wouldn't help get us some more organs uh, because people find it easier to not do anything and then allow it to happen, and those who don't want to will still opt out. So I, I favor that shift. There are a couple of other problems with our current system. You might think it would be useful to have your organ donation status listed on a card that you carry everywhere you go. If you do get in a bad accident and you come in to, say, uh, Bellevue, where I am, the first thing we do is we take your possessions and lock them away. And there's something else. Here's Robert. We allow relatives to override what's on the, the driver's license. And I was always curious about that. It turns out that our modern laws governing organ donation were modeled on European laws from the 1830s and had to do with donating bodies to medical schools. And it all came back to a man named Jeremy Bentham. He was so enthusiastic about making himself useful that he famously donated his body to science and was stuffed, semi-mummified, and put on display at University College London, where he still resides. Bentham and his colleagues were sort of a pre-bioethics bioethicists. These guys were utilitarians in the old sense that they believed in promoting the greatest happiness for the greatest numbers, and happiness is an emotion. And so what they thought about is you don't need your organs because you're dead. And that makes sense. You don't need them anymore. Give them away to somebody who does. Right, but what about your family members? They're still alive, and they still have a lot of emotions. So when we wrote the donation laws, they wrote them in the 1830s, they said we should always respect and allow families to override the wishes of the deceased. That got carried over, and now art's got a problem. There's another problem, which is emotionally, it's very hard for the medical team to not pay attention to the family who's alive and expressing their views, as opposed to the deceased who 
as a piece of paper somewhere or a computer item stored somewhere. So as human beings are wont to do, they respond to the folks who are still here and breathing and emoting. And that's a problem in and of itself. It's just hard to say, I'm going to take your liver based on a computer consent while widow screams in hall. I think everybody mm-hmm. is always nervous that that's a headline they don't want to read. You know, ethics is always about people. It's never about just the law. I agree, but I think for me, as a human being, I would much rather have part of me still be useful to someone, even if I myself am not here. But you don't get to make the decision. You're already dead. That's that's actually a good point. Dead people don't get to make decisions. But if I make a decision in my lifetime, then that should be still acknowledged after I'm dead. You better talk it through thoroughly with your family members. For Distillations, I'm Michal Meyer. And I'm Bob Kenworthy. Thank Thank you you for for listening. listening.